three greater rites of regeneration. Therefore, by nine months and three degrees, a man is made perfect. This is a very curious symbolism, but it has a great deal of interest if we know how to study it. In other words, the individual to pass through the second birth must go through the womb of the mysteries to complete the circle, of which nine parts only are provided in generation. The Chinese, fully aware of that, declare a child to be one year old after it has reached the third month. It celebrates its first birthday three months after it is born. This is part of a, of a very curious doctrine, but it points to the three winter or fall months leading toward final death. It is to do with the blinding of Samson, the cutting off of the rays of the sun god. Also has to do, as Leonardo da Vinci points out in his astronomical calculation of the Last Supper, for the painting is a very strangely astute piece of work. And each of the apostles, in each of the positions and groupings, you will find the apostles are grouped in triplicities, exactly like the signs. And the sign of Scorpio is assigned to Judas. Now why should the sign of Scorpio be assigned to Judas? In the Orient, there is something about the scorpion that is very peculiar. First of all, it stings with its tail. Therefore, it is the backbiter. The second thing that is about it that is strange is that the mark which it leaves is always in the form of a minute pair of human lips, the kiss of death, the kiss of betrayal. So that was the sign that was used to signify the destroyer, Typhon, who is also responsible for the destruction of the good god Osiris. The sign of the scorpion, however, in the ancient rituals has three meanings. Three creatures have been assigned to it down through the ages. And depending upon the one that is selected, uh, you have some concept of the true meaning of it. The scorpion is the one, is one sign that is associated with it. The second sign that is associated with it is the serpent. The third sign that is associated with it is the phoenix. So the scorpion, the serpent, and the phoenix were all given to that one sign of the zodiac. And the Rosicrucian mysteries of old European mysticism always bestowed their higher rites at the time of the sun being in a certain degree of Scorpio. Therefore, Scorpio was the symbol of death and rebirth of evil and redemption. Most of all, it was man transcending his own inferior nature. It was the symbol of initiation into the secret rites which symbolized death. It was the death of the old and birth into the new. It is death always leading to liberation. And we find all through the ancient symbolism these parallels carefully preserved even into your alchemical mysteries and in the combinations and structures of the alchemical stone of the wise man there is what is called the horoscope of the stone in other words there is a symbol of the universe represented as a particular pattern of planets and in this pattern of planets, the formula for the stone of the philosopher and the elixir of life and the transmutation of metal is said to have been concealed. And the mysterious eight-sided vault of Christian Rosenkreutz was formed into the symbol of a solar system, in the midst of which the body of the ancient adept is said to have been placed. All of these peculiar symbols trail down through the ages, reminding us of the numerous forms of indebtedness that we have to the planetary symbols. The Dionysian artificers, the great builders of the Greek cathedrals and churches, and also the builders of the theaters of Dionysus, 
Later they became the great Lombard builders of Europe, the builders of the medieval world and the Renaissance, the great Comocene masters. Nearly every one of the structures that they built was based mathematically upon a constellation. Uh, Cesarino, in his edition of Vitruvius, the great master of architecture, shows how the modes of architecture were based upon the great constellational patterns and that the temples of the gods were built according to the stars of the constellations in which these gods were said to be enthroned. A very elaborate and involved system of architecture rose therefore from this same consideration. Also we remember Gaffaro, the astronomer astrologer to Cardinal Richelieu, pointing out how the handwriting on the wall of heaven described in the Old Testament is actually a study of star groups in which the star constellations form the consonants of the Hebrew alphabet and the planets moving through them form the vowels. And the constant motion of the vowels and the consonants produced the writing upon the wall of sky which the ancient prophets could read. There are many references to these things and gradually there emerges to our consideration a concept of sidereal motion, of human growth, and of the linking of these two together in a highly complicated scientific concept. The details of this were evolved over so long a period of time and with such astuteness that it is almost impossible for us to exhaust the research work that has come down to us. Unfortunately, of course, it has been largely mutilated but enough remains to give us a tremendous amount of guidance if we actually want to have this guidance. We have other things that um, come out of this constellational study. The constellation, the oldest circular zodiac known, that which was found at Dendera in Egypt and is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, is a magnificent sandstone slab containing a study of the world of the heavens as they were known at that time. Many symbols and figures are included in this zodiac which we no longer recognize or have any means of fully understanding. But we do have certain points that are very interesting. The Egyptians referred to what we call the great bear as the plow. It was the symbol of the turner of the furrows, and of course the ox of heaven was the one that drew the plow. This plow moved around uh, the great polar star, and we have their knowledge now, which corresponds rather well with that of China and India, relating uh, to the axis of this great system. According to the Egyptians and uh, several other ancient peoples, the earth had more than two motions. Plumerian says eleven, and I think the ancients were very near to that. They recognized particularly a peculiar oscillation of the pole, by means of which it seemed to point, hypothetically at different times, to various stars or near to various stars forming the little bear. Therefore, the ancients termed this constellation in India the Rishi, or the great sages, who at various times incarnated to become rulers of the earth. And of these great sages, one that we know perhaps the best is Vyasa, the great sage of the Mahabharata. This comes to us also in Egypt. The Egyptians, following many ancient peoples and following practices still held under certain circumstances today, were concerned with the mystery of the northern point of the heavens. They were never able to observe that the sun moved northward, in the sense of ever occupying the northern segment of the sky. It came nearer or further, but never did it do in the north what it did in the south, as far as their visual awareness was concerned. Therefore, the northern hemisphere 
in the Egyptian ritual also, uh, was represented as the direction of darkness. In the ancient temple there was a gate at the east, west, and south, but no gate at the north. Now as a result of that, it has been held that people believed that from what the Greeks call the Hyperborean, or the area or region north of the winds, Hyperboreus, that from this region came only frost and snow giants and monsters. The Egyptians, however, did not do it that way. They had a very interesting astronomical outlook. Measurements have been taken uh, to study the glyph used in Egypt as the symbol of the great gods, particularly the abode of the great gods. This is always what appears to be an inverted bow or a half circle. Uh, turned upon a straight line. In other words, the bowl bowls or bulges upward, forming a half circle. This is a boss, mountain, or raised place. And through that streaks a line, like a vertical, not quite vertical staff, it is off the vertical. And at the upper end of that staff is a little flag symbol, just like a little banner, a quadrangle. Uh, apparently of cloth or something. The sign of a deity was always the staff with the flag, probably because in those days great and honored persons were accompanied by bearers of devices, heraldic symbols, much like the night heavens of the Middle Ages. But the thing that has always amazed students of Egyptology is the reason why in the abode of the great gods this flag staff cuts at an angle into this mountain or this mound. So somebody, for no good reason, perhaps it was Lepsius or one of the other early Egyptologists, began to study the inclination of this flag. And he examined a number of instances of it in great monuments. Of course you can't be certain in hastily written documents by comparatively poor scribes, but in the great stone carvings, in the great sarcophagi texts, and so on. He studied these things, and he found this was always the same. And he measured a little further, and he found that it coincides exactly with our inclination of the Earth's axis. What is it then? This mountain and this flag represents the North Pole, which was the abode of the gods, the great gods, that dwelled in silence. And in Egypt there was no symbol, no emblem, and no figure for the great gods. All the known gods, the gods of provinces, the creator gods, the cosmocrators, and the various Ammonian artificers, the creating gods that became later the Elohim of the opening chapters of Genesis, these deities are variously represented, sometimes with knives, representing the gougers, or the ones that carved matter out of space and formed worlds. Sometimes as Ta, the potter of Memphis, forming the globe on a potter's wheel. Always the concept of the potter's wheel and its turning, however. They seem to be aware of that motion in their ancient rituals. A little later, further research indicated that on the great figures of Osiris, the plumed double crown of the North-South Empire was always worn at the same inclination. So the crown of Egypt corresponded in the inclination in relationship to the vertical, corresponded with that of the flag inclination on the mound and also with the polar inclination. So here was an adornment, a symbol, tying to another principle, the principle of the pole and the polar mountain. Also we know the great pyramid by its orientation was an astronomical marker of some nature or kind. The complex of pyramids have been regarded as in probable, uh, probably the elements of a vast sundial system, similar in some ways to the complex of stones in England at Stonehenge, which was used by the Druids to determine the exact moment of the winter solstice. Here the great rituals were performed particularly by capturing the ray of the newborn sun in a crystal lens in order to stop the sacred fires by what we call burning glasses. 
all these symbols uh, are intriguing. And the great god 